Hello everybody, my name is Farmer Phil and in today's video, as you see in the title, Tillage for Dummies. Now I don't intend to offend anyone, it's just kind of a catchy title so it is, but this video is going to be about tillage, growing crops, we're going to look at cereals, beet and maize, kind of the main fodder crops for feeding cattle. We'll go through a very simplified version of growing them crops, different things and considerations you need to take because I am getting a world of messages from people about growing this crop, growing that crop, different advice and stuff and I just feel like making a video might hit the nail on the head. As everyone knows, feed prices, whether you're buying concentrates, buying fertilizer, buying any input now in farming is just mad expensive. So growing your own feed is, is one way of bringing down some of the costs. So I'm gonna try and run through it. So but before we get too much further in the video, don't forget to hit like button, subscribe to the channel, and ring the bell so you get notified of my videos every Tuesday, Thursday and Sunday. So where we are at the minute is what we call the bridge field. And as you can see the rushes, this was probably the worst bit of ground we ever tilled for ourselves. This is what you would call marginal ground, quite marginal ground. It is a mixture of some parts heavy clay and then where the rushes are growing, it's very much blue daub. And we grew tillage crops here, we grew oats here for three years. Start off the video at the start, picking the bit of ground that you want to till, you're thinking of going into crops. So the big thing is, no matter what piece of ground you want to look at, you're looking at it. Suitability, is it, how rocky is it going to be? Is there any big boulders you think might turn up into it? And then how dry is the piece of ground? Is it going to be dry between April and September on a normal year? If it's only dry in a good year, then you probably shouldn't plant it. A higher chance of you not going to get the crop in, the crop to grow, or the crop out, if it's only going to be dry in a good year. And their considerations. When it comes to this here is marginal ground, as we is the, probably the best way of putting it. It's disadvantaged land, is what it is, A and C. And um, you can see the rushes growing on it. When it comes to the type of ground that you're going to sow, ground like this that you'd kind of class as marginal, wetter ground that fits the criteria of you should be able to travel between April and September. The best crop to grow in this type of ground is oats. We've always found oats does best in your lower quality, your more marginal ground. Now, I know oats isn't maybe the best feeding of the whole lot, but we've always found it tends to grow best in this kind of ground. And that's what we grew here for the three years. And the last year, the, <laughs> in them three years, one year we got the combine stuck in the far corner. And then the last year we harvested it, we caught it in whole crop and we left tracks across the half of it and we could never mow it and we receded it purely because it was just that borderline too wet and it suited us more in grass than it did in tillage because it's just a wet field but it can grow a crop if needed. So if you're thinking of growing your barley, your wheat, your beet or your maize, your wheat and your barley you can grow on heavier ground, ground that would be that slight bit wetter that you'd fit the April to September criteria but when it comes to beet and maize they need to be dry into October, November because both beet and maize are late harvest. You're looking at October, November for both of them crops to be harvested. So you need to pick ground that's going to be dry to grow them. The other big thing when you're picking your piece of ground is get the soil tested so that you know what nutrients you need to put out when you're sowing. If you need any other nutrients and particularly for beet, uh, you need to know what the boron content of the soil is so that you need, if you need to put out boron um, when you're growing the crop as it's to do with the uh, leaves and boron is a big thing with the beet that you need, really need to know. So when it comes to preparing ground like this, the standard procedure is spray off it, eat it tight, so get it as, as tight as you can. I'd class this as too long, there's not a lot of grass here, but you want it as tight as tight as can be. Spray it off and plow it. You can min till, I don't think we've ever mini tilled um, grass, like lay ground and grew crops on it. I think we've always generally plowed it. And spraying off is, something on a normal year you would do but this year the cynic life phosphate roundup is massive money it's it's ridiculously priced compared to other years so you could get away without spraying off but you'd need to have the plow well set and you need to make sure that you're burying all the grass that your skimmers are doing their job and that you, you see a field with no hues of green or no little bits of leaves sticking up 
to try and get the crop the grass buried and make sure it dies if you're growing beet you need to spray off because beet is very very hard to control weeds in very hard it takes a lot of sprays and stuff to control the weeds in beet so you really do need to spray off when it comes to beet when you have your field plowed and then when it comes to plowing the field you need to make sure that it's dry don't be trying to plow wet ground you want to make sure your ground is dry suit to be plowed get it plowed when you have your ground plowed you want to harrow it and if there's a lot of stones in the ground power harrows don't generally suit and if it's wet ground if you end up having to do it in less than ideal conditions power harrowing isn't the best job we don't use a power harrow because we find we're predominantly any of our tillage ground is all heavy land it can get wet and we always found the power harrow does not help that situation so i'd more advise a disc harrow if your ground isn't that overly good the power harrow tends to leave a pan or it minces it just wouldn't be big on power harrows generally when you plow it you can either one pass it straight in or you can disc it and sow it or disc it twice and sow it it all depends on how level you get the field so when it comes to the sowing times for all these crops anytime from now this video should be up on thursday you can be sowing away up until the latest we sowed crops before was into the beginning of may and when it comes to the sowing of the three cereal crops barley wheat and oats the earlier you sow the earlier you should harvest and also the earlier you sow the less seed you sow the later you sow the more seed you put into the ground and that's to do with tillering and that's how the crop when it comes up it starts to divide into different shoots that produce the grain later on you sow the less tillering happens so the more seeds you have to put in to get the same amount of crop out now one other crop i didn't mention beans beans we're actually going to hurt to sow our beans tomorrow beans is a quite an easy crop to grow and um, again you're harvesting in october so it needs to be dry ground but beans is getting a bit on the late side for sowing beans beans kind of needs to be in in march so it's a bit late for this one but one of the good things about beans is you don't need any fertilizer because beans generates its own nitrogen and the big thing with beans if you were to go down that road is you need to be on top of your weeds and then be on top of your chocolate spot which is a fungus and once you're on top of them two things beans is quite easy to grow and if you want to know how much seed to put in you may get in contact with an agronomist or that i'm not going to go through real specific details because i don't want people ringing me or message me saying i done this and it didn't work i'm just giving you a brief outline of all the things i can think of that goes into growing these crops so you can make the decision for yourself generally speaking you'd put out sowing fertilizer so you put out compound 10 10 20 18 6 12 depending on your results from your soil test now you slurry will cover that um cattle slurry if i remember rightly is 5 7 32 and pig slurry is 9 9 5 20 or something like that and that's a uh, cattle slurry being six percent dm and pig slurry being four percent and that can replace your sowing manure something we haven't done and we're going to be doing tomorrow sowing our beans and going to try and incorporate this year because of fertilizer prices so if you want to try and replace that compound going out you need to read up on putting out the slurry so when it comes to maize and beet it's the same process as sowing but you don't roll it after sowing maize or beet and you sow them in may predominantly in may if you're sowing maize under plastic you generally sow maybe the end of april if you're sowing without plastic you sow into may to to get the good weather when you have the ground tilled you have your crop sown one of the big things is rolling the ground and two reasons you roll the ground one is to create a nice compact seed bed so you get a more even germination the other thing is to put down the stones if you are unfortunate for the crop to lodge you need the stones down so you have some chance of getting it lifted without doing harm to machinery so rolling is a big thing and preferably with a cambridge roller or a ring roller over a flat roller because a flat roller if you get wet weather after rolling with a flat roller it can create a pan and the water will sit on top of the ground and it'll start killing crop it just doesn't perform so ring roller is more preferred over flat roller but flat roller will do but rolling is quite a, an essential piece to make sure you get them stones down in case the crop lodges and it also helps even germination now one thing if you are putting it into lay ground you have to keep an eye out for pests two pests in particular wireworm and leather jackets and the only way you'll know if you have them without starting to scoop up the soil and seeing are they actually in there is when the crop starts to be established you'll see 
patches of the crop going yellow and if you go to pick up or to pull the plant you literally pull up the leaves you won't pull up the root and that's either the wire worm or the leather jacket eating the stem above the root and below the leaf and they can clear quite a bit of ground and they're really only a problem in lay ground and we've seen it on some lay ground not all lay ground but we've seen it in some of the lay ground we've plowed in the past them being a problem and treating for them is quite specific it's spraying when there's a little bit of rain forecast but not too much rain it's a little bit of a hardship that's one thing when you're plowing lay ground or tilling into lay ground you need to be aware of is them pests and they're up for cereals another thing when it comes to lay ground and we've seen it quite a few times is if when you're plowing lay ground that top surface that the grasses were growing for god knows how many years that's your fertile layer of soil and when you plow that you're plowing up the under soil the less fertile soil we've often seen that first year rotations into lay ground crops don't perform that well it takes a lot of feeding a lot of fertilizer so that's one thing to keep in mind that lay ground doesn't generally perform best on its first year when it comes to sprays your weed spray is the first big challenge you have to go over so i think we're going to leave the big this field and we're going to go to our winter wheat to just kind of talk about it there Liv also should have put in drone footage of different processes in the video just to make it a little bit more than me talking to the camera because i know that can be quite boring get in the gear and we tip over to the winter wheat that we put slurry out on two weeks ago could be three weeks ago so now we're out here on our crop of winter wheat you can see there you can still see some of the slurry or lines of slurry on it but the field has greened up a lot since we got the job done it's working into the crop you can see it's starting to grow nicely so it is so the next thing big thing on the agenda after you have the crop in you got it established and you got the pests in order if you had any is weeds now there's two options when it comes to weed control you have post-emergence and pre-emergence pre-emergence is spraying the crop basically after you sow it it requires a little bit on the weather side as you need a little bit of rain not a lot of rain to get the spray to kind of work into the soil so that it kills weeds before they come up post-emergence is spraying it after the weeds have come up which is generally what we do so you can see this crop here it was done post emergence you can't see any weeds in it. it's just wheat there's there's no there's no weeds that i can see there anyways there's there's a bit coming up there a bit there but generally speaking the crop is quite very clean and weeds is the first big challenge is to beat the weeds if the weeds beat your crop you're on the hind tip from there in if the crop beats the weeds you're pretty good this crop now at this stage with the height the crop has gone to it's as you can see it's, it's basically closing in the field so there's no sunlight can get down into the ground and <coughs> at this stage it's fairly safe from weeds so as i said you had your post-emergence and your pre-emergence post-emergence pre-emergence is kind of dependent on the weather if you go post-emergence that's where you need to identify the weeds you have and be able to use the right sprays and when it comes to using the right sprays on lay ground which i presume anyone watching that's kind of for the use of a better word first time tillage getting into tillage lay ground generally won't have any spray resistant weeds so you should be able to get them but it's very important that you get the spray on right so that you don't either put out too little don't kill the weed or put out too much and check the crop and what we mean by check the crop is basically stunt it when it comes to beet beet is very 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 hard to control weeds beet and spraying for weeds is very very tricky but if you can control the weeds and beet once the beet fill the alleys you're sorted you're on the pig's back maize maize is generally done with a pre-emergent spray and once it's sown and sprayed right with the pre-emergent spray you basically have no issues for the rest of the year so when it comes then to more fertilizer because the crop is going to require more fertilizer now every crop has a different amount of units of nitrogen that it needs to produce generally speaking if you have dung available i should have said start the video if you've dung available plow it into the ground if you have slurry available maybe put put incorporate into the ground when you're sowing as you've seen we put slurry on this crop at this stage to give it a, a boost on the next stage that this will get fertilizer is when it's quite high when the flag leaf is out and it's called top dressing and that's trying to get the nitrogen into the plant when the flag leaf which is the big main leaf and that's the leaf 
that feeds the plant and produces the grain, produces the fruit of the crop. And that's when we target it for more nitrogen to give it the final push to produce good fruit. When it comes to maize, you generally you put out most of the fertilizer when you sow it. Um, when like what we done last year when it was knee high, which is which normally with maize they always say knee high on the 4th of July. When it was knee high we put out a spray on fertilizer, a foliar fertilizer, to give it another kick on. But anyways, that's the fertilizer on the crops. So you need to, as, as one of the things I was just told, to get it out of the crop, you have to put it into it. So if you don't put on the fertilizer, you're not going to get out of it. And by what means you put on that fertilizer, whether it's spray-ons, whether it's artificial, whether it's organic, manure fert or slurry, that's up to yourself and what you think is going to work best for you. Next thing is getting into more of the sprays. So some of the other sprays that we would generally use is what we call a growth regulator or a shortener. If you're growing oats, a shortener is very much advisable because oats can grow to be quite tall. So putting a shortener or growth regulator on it, you put on it at the, I'm trying to remember, is it the tillering stage? So when this crop here, this, this crop is at the tillering stage. So it's where the crop, you can see all these, that's a tiller, that's a tiller. Every, every one of them stalks is a tiller. Other field is all the spray and so I don't know too much about the spray, but I'm trying to be as basic as I can. The reason you put on a growth regular is to keep it short because the taller the crop is, the more likely the crop is to lodge. And lodge means basically lie down flat. And if your crop lies down flat, you're looking at serious reduced in yields. You're looking at very hard to get harvested. And if you didn't have the field rolled or the stones well picked, you're looking at serious damage to machinery as well, trying to get that crop up. Sometimes crops are gone unsalvageable if you get the wrong weather at the wrong times when it comes to lodging. Flip side of it, your growth regulator is going to reduce the amount of straw you're going to get because the crop won't grow as tall. Another big end when it comes to spraying is your fungicides. The main fungicides that you'll be looking at when it comes to beans is chocolate spot when it's wheat, barley and oats. You're looking at your rhynchosporiums, your rust, your septora, and they're all basically come out when your flag leaf comes out. They're all funguses that attack the crop. And when it comes to fungicides, you're being preventative, not treating it. And it's probably best seek the help of an agronomist or someone who's more experienced in the industry to help you out with getting into that you have you have your crop sowed you got by the pests you got by the weeds you have you got the right fertilizers you have your crop is coming on it's coming ready for harvesting when it comes to the cereal crops you have three what i would call mainstream options you have whole cropping you have crimping and you have dry harvesting cutting it dry those three options all have different harvest times and you can choose your ground according to which one if you were wanting to whole crop ground which is generally the first one you would do you can put on that little bit wetter ground you can sow it later you can harvest it earlier you're crimping it you do need your better ground and when if you're dry grain you need to have everything pretty good when it comes to whole cropping if you're going for pit or bales makes two it makes two differences to it if you're going for bales you cut it very early on you cut it when the seed when the grain in the head it hasn't isn't starting to get hard because if the grain starts to get hard the cattle won't digest it when it comes to eating it. when it comes to whole cropping it it all depends on whether your contractor has the equipment or not if you have a mill you can let it ripen out a bit stronger and you can mill the grain through the harvester and that gets you the advantage of being a, the cattle being able to digest all the grain or you cut it earlier when the grain is that bit softer fermentation helps break it down and the cattle are able to digest the grain they are the two options and there's three stages of grain ripening you have milky cheesy and hard so that basically means when you squeeze it you're getting lots of juice out of it that's milky you're squeezing it there's no juice and it's, it's a bit soft still that's the cheesy and when you can't squeeze it and when you can't like bust it with your fingers that's when it's starting to hard there are the three stages of ripening and when you're whole cropping if you're whole cropping for bales or uh, harvested without a mill you're looking at the milky stage if you're whole cropping or crimping which is the other one you're looking at the cheesy stage to get the most out of it and that transition is the grain going from sugars to starch if i remember rightly so crimping which i haven't touched on crimping is where you cut the grain when it's at the cheesy stage it's high moisture you 
put hand of the bonnet, you roll it and you put in a clamp like you would with silage you cover it, you seal it, you roll the absolute bejesus out of it and you, near, you put sand on it two reasons you put sand on it because it takes a lot of compaction you need to seal it really well and the vermin absolutely love advantages of crimp you can store it outside, it doesn't have to be dry you can cut it early if you are having that bit of a badder year it feeds quite well the cattle, downside seems it doesn't keep that well that was the last time we had crimp, it didn't keep very well that's why we didn't do it again when it comes to whole crop, the advantages of whole cropping is you can cut it early, you can put in your silage pit on top of under silage, generally works quite well feeds out quite well, downsides you don't have any straw to gather for, for bedding and well, that's really yes, you don't have any straw to gather for bedding you can also when you're doing whole cropping you can also under sow the crop with grass seeds so that you can take your crop of whatever wheat barley oats you've put on top of it and you can have grass coming on underneath it right when it comes to combining it so that's dry harvesting it you're looking to get your moistures dependent now again more complications so when it comes to harvesting it dry our general run of the mill what we do is we spray it off so we use roundup once the field has got to that grain is hard stage we use roundup spray off the field the reason for that is it dries out all the grain it kills everything off it leaves the grain all dries out evenly because you can have it that you can have half a field ripening very well and you can have the other field still green and that can be a bit tricky when it comes to harvesting and also getting the straw whereas if you use roundup you kill everything, everything ripens even, everything dries out very well and you can basically, what you see in a lot of our videos you can bale the same day you cut, which you can't really do if you don't spray off but to my understanding you can't spray off if it's going for human consumption and when it comes to spraying off the crop you spray it off leave it seven days before you can harvest it to let the residuals of the glyphosate run out of the crop and then you have about two to four weeks to harvest the crop before the crop starts to basically disintegrate and the heads fall down and the crop is gone so it is burning it off does leave you a time frame but we've always found it best to make sure that you get the crop dry and you get the straw when you need it and when it comes to dry harvesting your aim is to get around the 16 percent moisture the higher the moisture the more likely it is to heat the lower the moisture the better and when you're treating it then you have options if you wanted to put more additives you have the likes of your alkaline your maximum which increases the ph and increases the protein in the in the finished product and that can work up to i think 22 percent moisture if your moisture is over 20 percent or over 22 percent you, you kind of have to go down the acid route propionic acid is the general one that's used yeah you have to go down the acid route to get it to keep long enough to feed the cattle so I think I've covered it all. There's anything else to cover? Um, no, I think I've everything covered. If there's anything you feel like I've left out, leave it in the comments down below. If there's any other tillage growers that have any other suggestions for people who are playing with the idea of growing, in the comments down below. If I've forgotten, in the comments down below. But the one big thing that we have absolutely no control over and that can make and break a year at tillage is the weather. It's a little bit overcast not the best evening but it's not too bad it's not raining but the weather can absolutely break you you can have everything done right you can have done all the plowing towing and silling perfect got perfect crop establishment no problem with pests got the weeds under control from day one all the fertilizers fungicides everything spot on perfect loveliest of crops coming on you can get a storm puts down the crop lodges it leaves it that flat it's like you run a roller across the field or you can get a wet harvest ground be too wet crop never gets dry it can break you it broke us one year 2016 we lost uh, over 100 acres somewhere nearly 200 acres of crops we never got harvested only done a ton to the acre all down to the weather nothing else the crops are perfect but the weather damned us that is the biggest thing you have to remember with tillage the weather is the biggest aspect and it's the same with the maize, maize is very straightforward when it comes to harvesting, harvest it, silage pit, but maize requires a good sunny year. Maize, if it gets wrong weather at wrong times, it either won't grow that high, it won't pollinate, you won't get cobs. Maize is very tricky, very expensive to grow. Beet, beet is easy enough when you get the weeds under control, but beet, if you get a wet harvest, you just won't get over. But tillage is very tricky. You really do need to know what you're doing and you need to be able to accept the risk that you can do everything perfect but the weather may be against you. 
I think I've covered everything I need to say but the big thing and the reason for this video is to give people kind of a rough idea of what goes into growing the crops so you can make an informed decision because that is the main thing when you go to make decisions you need to be making informed ones and I would highly advise anyone who is seriously considering watch the videos thinks yeah maybe I have a bit of ground of suitable maybe I can do this that or the other and I'll be able to do a bit highly recommend you get in touch with an agronomist someone in your locality that grows crops to just give you more advice specific advice maybe on the ground type you have the area some places grow different crops well some places don't it's just one of them things highly recommend you get in touch with more people before you commit because crops if you do it right it costs money and if you're going to be i've seen it before people sow a crop close the gate come back in the harvest and then wonder why they don't have anything to harvest if you're going to do that just don't bother grow crop leave it in grass because there's nothing worse than half-assing it because you're just wasting everybody's time you're as well leave it in grass as to grow a crop half-assed if you're going to grow it you have to put the inputs into it and that is why it's just it can be costly if the, you, anything goes wrong on you so I think I'm going to leave it at that for today's video. I think I've everything that I need to say said. And if you have any comments, any more questions, leave them in the comments down below. Either I'll try and answer them or if anyone who's watching who has more information or wants to help people out in the comments, go into the comments, help people out. Leave anything you think I forgot or missed out on down there. But at the end of the day, crops is all well and good but the weather will damn you so i'm going to leave it at that for today's video hope you enjoyed it as always please like and subscribe to the channel videos every tuesday thursday and sunday that is it for me good luck